very happy to have uh, to host today uh, Chava Palas, our speaker in the same. I am. Um, I think we have a uh, so to find this balance in the in the seminars between ecology and evolution, between going more organic uh, based and, and molecular based. We have a, a we have today a, a talk on this um, on the uh, on the evolutionary perspective on the different layers of organization in biology. And Sabapal uh, will be our speaker based in uh, Czeged in Hungary. I hope I have pronounced it approximately well. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then, so Tsevapal has worked um, um, first in Hungary, then moving to Bath, Heidelberg, and Oxford before going back to, to Hungary first, with the, uh, where he has enjoyed the uh, two ERC grants, and working on, on, on gene dosage, on gene evolution, and the rates of evolution as a function, for instance, of transcription and gene expression on the, um, the robustness of uh, for for the mechanisms under underlying robustness of gene evolution and um, and uh, i think we're very happy today to uh, to uh, to we'll be very happy to listen to your talk on the phenotypic consequences uh, of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of evolution uh, very much looking forward to 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 your talk thanks thank you very much all so the stage is yours okay thanks a lot kind of you guys I share the screen. Okay. Is it visible to all of us, I guess? So I just yes, perfect. It, perfect. Great. Thanks. Okay. So first of all, I would like to thank for the invitation. It's very kind of you. And uh, I'm very excited to talk about this new project, which as a matter of fact, I've been thinking on for nearly 10 years, but the output was very little. And in the past two years, I found the right collaborators to, uh, to work this uh, project out and find the, find the right people. So I pretty much initiated the project, but I'm not necessarily the main player in that now. So in a nutshell, uh, what I'm interested in now when it comes to evolutionary biology is compensatory evolution. Is it likely that uh, when we see signs of signatures of uh, genes that were positively selected, uh, is it likely that it's uh, an adaptation to a novel environment, to environmental changes? Or it might be the case that there is uh, no changes in the environmental conditions, no new adaptive forces. It's basically uh, the result of two forces, accumulation of deleterious mutations, uh, which are later compensated by other mutation, which will, uh, whereby organism regain fitness. Now, why is it uh, possible that that uh, compensatory evolution might be an important force in evolution? What we know is that uh, slightly deleterious mutations are actually very common, actually far more common than uh, non-adaptive, uh, sorry, adaptive or neutral mutation, and they can readily fix in the population by banning many different means. Uh, and it actually, it can occur also in population, also in a population which have a very high population sizes by different means. So it's not just genetic drift that can drive the fixation of these mutations, but it could be genetic draft, hitchhiking, changes in environment, et cetera, et cetera. So I was wondering uh, for a long time whether this could be an important evolutionary force. Uh, as a matter of fact, we all know, and there are many examples that the molecular blueprints of compensatory evolution are all around. People analyzed the structure of RNA across species and they found deleterious and compensatory mutations in the structure, also in protein-protein interactions. There are many, many different works that demonstrate that genomic expression changes, although remain unchanged, uh, the underlying mechanism of, um, of uh, regulation has changed dramatically as a result of compensatory evolution. Now, viruses actually are very, very strong candidates for compensatory evolution, not least because the mutation rate of many different viruses, especially RNA-based viruses, are extremely high. And there's a very interesting example of compensatory evolution, uh, which is a main topic for our lab is antibiotic resistance. Now these antibiotic resistance mutations uh, 
clearly provide selective advantage when the bacteria face um, uh, a new drug or an antibiotic. But many of these mutations and also the genes that are derived by horizontal gene transfer have actually high fitness cost in many cases. So they actually reduce the growth rate of bacteria when no antibiotic resistance is present. So the reason why this is actually interesting because it suggests that for many mutations, the case could be that uh, they have in, in, in uh, the net effect of a mutation in certain condition is beneficial, but they've got some slightly or more uh, or slightly deleterious side effects, which uh, they could affect different fitness components, which are later compensated by other mutations. And this is actually the case with antibiotic resistance. This is why this is so get rid of uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria because there are readily many mutations that can compensate the fitness defect of the resistance mutation without losing resistance. So we all know these examples, but how general it is and how can it be, uh, can it be readily studied in the laboratory? So what we did uh, some time ago is uh, we uh, initiated a study to uh, investigate compensatory evolution uh, you know, on a large scale, basically, on hundreds of genes and whether it could readily occur in the laboratory. So what we did is uh, the reason we focused on Saccharomyces cerevisiae is because um, uh, there are very good gene knockout libraries for Baker's yeast. So basically, they are isogenic strains. Uh, they are identical except for the presence or absence of a given gene. Now, many of these genes uh, appear to be non-essential in the sense that the, uh, these knockout uh, strains can still grow in the laboratory, at least under some conditions, uh, but they, uh, they have some fitness defects. So they, uh, so they grow and divide at a slower rate than the wild type. So we started with nearly 200 slow-growing haploid single gene knockout strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, these single knockouts actually cover a wide range of functional defects. Um, and basically we did the simplest experiment possible. We ran experiment evolution, a so-called batch selection experiment where we exposed them, uh, we, we let them grow in the laboratory, transferred a small fraction of the population to a new tube and started the process again and again and again for 400 generations. Now, the main difference between this set of experiment and uh, most other laboratory evolution experiments that we had no external stress in use. So basically, this was a paradise for uh, normal wild type yeast. They could do, grow pretty well and were actually extremely well in the laboratory without the, uh, without the defect. So basically the stress comes from inside, from the cell itself, from the, uh, from the lack of the gene. You will see shortly that was indeed the case and there was practically no physical adaptation to the environment. It was adaptation to, uh, to, the, to minimize the fitness defect due to the knockouts. So in a nutshell, we had four parallel evolving lines per knockout strains. So they were isogenic they, and the four lines could evolve and accumulate mutations in the laboratory and see what happens. And also we had 22 wild type lines as controls. So these lines had no defect, uh, no knockouts in there. And otherwise they were isogenic to the other, other strains and we let them evolve to see if there would be any evolution. They would be used as a control. Okay. So what happens? I would just like to very, very briefly summarize it without getting into the detail. So what we observed is that the knockout strains, the knockout mutant strains uh, had a, a very high fitness gain in 200, in 400 generations, sorry. So basically the, uh, the Y type fitness level recovered uh, in 68% of the cases. So even, even though they still had the knockouts, they could still grow as fast as, uh, as the wild type strains. Meanwhile, the evolving wild types without the knockouts showed very little or practically no or 4% fitness uh, increase. So the adaptation to the physical condition was minimal. It was largely adaptation 
to the loss of the to compensate the loss of the single gene. Okay, so uh, and there's a, there was one extremely exciting case, and not just an, an interesting observation that these mutations, these compensatory mutations that have accumulated during the course of laboratory evolution, they were actually deleterious in the Y-type genetic background. So it's, they, they do not provide any fitness, self, fitness benefit or act even more, they were deleterious for the Y-type when they were introduced. It, these, these, studies, these experiments actually demonstrated that it's really about compensating the fitness defect due to the loss of a single gene. So uh, again, it just really in a nutshell, what we observed is that these large number of evolved knockout strains reached a very high fitness in the laboratory in, in under one environmental condition. They were indistinguishable at the phenotypic level from the white type when it comes to fitness. Uh, but when we sequenced these uh, evolved lines, we found a wide range of mechanisms and molecular, uh, molecular mechanism underlying the compensation, even if they were started from the same single gene knockout. So it suggests that there are many and multiple ways to compensate or mitigate the fitness defect um, of, of the knockouts. Now, we also had some transcriptome study, transcriptomic studies and uh, that was very interesting because if the, fan, if the fitness was restored, is it likely that the genomic expression pattern is also restored? And this was not the case. So the gene perturbation, the loss of the single gene generally affected the expression of hundreds of genes simultaneously. And of course, it also had a low fitness. But when we get back to the normal fitness level, the gene expression state, which was uh, the vital gene expression state, was not restored for the whole, whole across the whole genome. It was basically remained unperturbed, or actual novel uh, expression changes occurred in many, many other genes, in hundreds of other genes. So, in a, in a nutshell, what this actual study demonstrated is that. Uh, Compensatory evolution actually promoted the molecular diversification of the strain. At the phenotypic level, they look more or less the same uh, at, at, in terms of fitness, but when you consider um, the molecular blueprints of compensatory evolution, they differed from each other, which actually suggested that uh, upon some certain environmental changes, these population will behave very, very differently. Now, and, and we, we were wondering whether compensatory evolution could be actually as a pre-adaptation, if you like, to new environmental changes and conditions. So this is, this is our second point, and this is the main topic I would like to discuss today. Uh, I was wondering what exactly that drive a major phenotypic novelties uh, like in the case of cellular morphology, what drives the evolution of cellular morphology? Now the standard picture uh, and the neo adaptation is you is that when uh, new morphologies emerge as a result to adaptation to new environmental conditions or environmental changes. There are so many classic examples and this is clearly the case. No one doubts that this is, happens in the majority of the cases, but we were wondering whether morphology, cellular morphology and other phenotypic traits could actually evolve and change just as a byproduct, even in a constant environment, as a result of the accumulation of deleterious and compensatory mutations. So may it be the case that compensatory evolution drives morphological changes. So in order, you may wonder, why should we focus on cellular morphology? Well, from a previous gene knockout studies, systematic knockout studies, we know that roughly half of the genes, non-essential genes in yeast, Baker's yeast, actually shape and modify morphological characters like cell shape, roundness, cell size. So some of these strains have a very high fitness actually, but when it comes to the morphology, they differ substantially from each other. So we thought that 
whenever there is an adaptation going on or some modification in these genes as a result of compensatory evolution, morphology may just change as a byproduct. Uh, the second motivation was, is that we, uh, there was a very exciting study some time ago where they uh, measured um, different uh, morphological characters of natural yeast strains. And uh, they found substantial differences in the morphology, but apparently no correlation with the, eco the normal ecological conditions these yeast strains uh, usually live in. So similarity in ecology doesn't mean similarity in morphological characters, which actually suggests that it may not necessarily be the case that this is all about adaptation to new environments. So what we did uh, is that we had these evolved lines, uh, knockout evolved lines, and we used a high throughput microscopy protocol coupled with automated image analysis and uh, basically we copy pasted the previous protocol published in PNAS. And uh, we, we were lucky enough to have some experts on uh, high throughput microscopy analysis in, in our institute. And in all, we actually studied a, a very large number of morphological traits, including cell size, roundness, nucleus position, polarity, et cetera, et cetera. And we measured them, these characters, these traits, for a large number of evolved lines and the corresponding gene knockouts to see what's going on. Actually, we found uh, that uh, a very large number of the evolved lines have actually changed massively in uh, cellular morphology. And this is a cluster analysis, uh, a very detailed figure. What we see is one of them is the Y type cellular morphology and there were some extensive changes in the morphological characters. Now, bear in mind that all of them have high fitness and despite the high fitness, the morphology actually is different. And moreover, we could identify new morphotypes. So basically different, uh, basically characteristic changes in the cellular morphology. There are at least uh, four or five of them. One of them was with larger and round mother cells, larger bots. The other has round mother cells, elongated bots, non elliptic nuclear shape, et cetera, et cetera. And for each of these, um, these morphotypes, there, are, there were very specific uh, gene knockouts. So per cell polarity changes uh, were perturbing. One of the morphotypes perturbed or, or basically a knockout in DNA repair genes and lipid metabolism, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result of compensatory evolution, these changes were actually reinforced or at least maintained. So here comes an important issue. What exactly drive these morphological changes? There could be two different scenarios. The initial change in morphology is induced by the knockout, the deleterious mutation per se. And basically what compensatory evolution it does is actually it it only maintains these initial changes. Or the other scenario is that uh, deleterious mutation have no impact on the cellular morphology. It's rather the compensatory evolution and the mutations per se that induce these changes. And as a matter of fact, we generally find that it's the combination of these two forces. And there are roughly half of half of the cases that belong to one or the other scenario. We investigate these uh, two scenarios in more details, and hopefully we will get a clear picture what it actually depends on. So uh, here comes probably the most exciting bit. We were wondering whether these um, uh, morphological changes, especially bot elongation, could actually shape ecological relevant traits or pathogenic or traits that are especially relevant in pathogenic yeast species like Candida. So we were uh, focusing on uh, the, the following traits, filament formation, flocculation, which is pretty much an aggregation of uh, these, uh, of these uh, unicellular yeast in response to environmental changes, the capacity to fear form biofilms and invasive growth phenotypes. Now, what you need to know is that different yeast strains have different capacity 
to provide uh, different capacity and many differences uh, in the capacity to generate these uh, phenotypes, the laboratory strain has um, extremely, have lost most of this capacity. So basically flocculation, biofilm formation, invasive growth can only induce on the very specific environmental condition. So the genetic um, network, if you like, is still there in yeast, but it needs some extra mutations, if you like, to generate or re regenerate these phenotypes. So in order to measure the phen these phenotypes, we did a couple of pretty standard microbiological assays, nothing really specific. So one of them is uh, measuring settling ratio. It's basically you put a population into the incubation and the shaker, and you wait how long it takes them to settle. And basically what we find is that 50% of the evolved lines show uh, is significantly enhanced settling ratio compared to the wild type. While the evolved lines from the wild type, which have no, no um, knockouts in there, showed no, uh, no enhancing settling ratio. Now, why is that important? Because settling ratio is actually a very good indicator of flocculation, and we could actually confirm this. So a large fraction of the populations show different, uh, show, uh, have a capacity for flocculation, at least under certain conditions. Now, the second uh, uh, test we did was uh, basically we developed, not developed, we copy-pasted or implemented a pipeline to measure biofilm formation. In a nutshell, you put the populations onto high density and then to low density agar plates, you incubate them for five days, and then you actually use image processing to measure the biofilm area. And in that case, bio enhanced biofilm formation was um, pretty rare. It happened only in four of the evolved lines, but nevertheless, it did happen. And the last essay, was, and probably this was the most exciting bit, was the agar invasion assay. So uh, basically, it, it's very, very simple. Again, you put the population onto a solid medium, a uh, high density solid medium, you plate the population, you, uh, you actually wash them, and then you see which of these population can actually remain on the agar plates. Again, using uh, uh, photos and image process, uh, uh, highly detailed image processing protocol, which as a matter of fact, I cannot really understand. I was completely relying on the expertise of my collaboration. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a very, very simple um, essay. And again, 50% of the evolved lines showed evidence for enhanced invasive growth. And uh, in some cases, the laboratory evolved lines show higher invasive growth phenotypes than many of the natural yeast isolates we actually studied. So that was promising. Uh, so in sum, we find that uh, over one third of the evolved uh, lines displayed major changes in one, at least one of these three major phenotypic traits. So it suggests that compensatory evolution, again, without the need for any new environmental condition could generate these phenotypes uh, without the need for uh, any new, uh, without any changes in the, con in the environment. So let me just show you finally one example where we wanted to get into the detail, what's actually going on, what are the molecular mechanisms? Uh, now, uh, the, the gene that we studied is BOP3. It's actually what you observe is that uh, when it comes, it shows uh, the evolved lines show evidence for invasive growth uh, and also filament formation uh, when we checked it uh, in the microscope. So what's going on? So basically, BOP3 is a spindle assembly checkpoint gene. And in the absence of these genes, uh, 
it has a very, uh, the corresponding strain has a, um, a major fitness defect, largely because it, in the absence of the checkpoint gene, it generates onoploidy. And, uh, and uh, but it can apparently restored by a compensatory mutation uh, in a morphogenesis checkpoint gene called SWE1. Now, this is actually interesting because the combination of the deleterious mutation and this single gene could completely recover the fitness. And uh, ploidy was partially restored also in the evolved lines as a result of the compensatory mutation in the SWE1 gene. Now, uh, what is actually interesting is that SWE1, what it actually, this mutation, acts through extending one phase, the G2 phase of the cell cycle, thereby allowing uh, basically a longer time for a longer period for uh, the cells to recover and uh, restore the normal ploidy level. And as a byproduct of this uh, mutation, we also have that, that this SWE1 mutation results in elongated bots. Uh, compared to the Y-type cell, even in a normal and Y-type genetic background. But apparently uh, this compensatory mutation alone is not enough to generate the invasive phenotypes. You need the loss of function mutation plus the compensatory mutation to, uh, to get an invasive phenotype, okay? So basically this demonstrates that the combination of the two forces, first the deleterious or by anemic combination, the co basically the loss of function mutation plus the compensatory mutation will generate uh, uh, the new phenotype. So I would just like to sum up uh, where we are at the moment and uh, what is the main novelty of what I believe is uh, and the implication of our finding. I could actually summarize the point in this very simple paragraph, uh, or sorry, in this uh, graph. Uh, basically, you start on a fitness peak with the Y type strain, and there's a knockout which will lead to a lower fitness. And uh, the evolved lines uh, accumulate mutations, uh, a compensatory mutation, we, whereby they regain fitness. And uh, what actually happens is that. And this is, this is an interesting probability is that as a side effect of this process, there are several morphological novelties and new phenotypes may emerge. Now, and, and uh, what is interesting that this could be a sort of pre-adaptation to new environmental niches. So there are several outstanding questions and important questions that have remained unanswered and needs very different perspectives and different protocols to, and different methods to study. So one of them is how common compensatory mutations are in nature. What fraction of the adaptive mutation are the result of compensatory evolution rather than adaptation in new conditions per se? Uh, second, what are the driving evolutionary forces? What are the population genetic conditions? Is it likely that uh, this process will more likely to, uh, um, to happen in species with high or low population sizes? How recombination would affect this process? Now we, we are getting to the stage where uh, it's getting easier and easier to test these, um, uh, test these um, scenarios or this, uh, uh, this uh, different hypothesis uh, using uh, the accumulated genomic data. So for example, one might argue that adaptive mutation may actually be more prevalent in small population sizes, or one might argue that uh, adaptive mutations or major changes can actually occur in subsystems which are highly conserved. And this is actually the case with um, with cell cycle genes. The interesting thing is that it's a very conserved cellular function. And despite the conservation of the cellular function of cell cycle genes in yeast, there are many loss events that can be observed across yeast strains. 
So, and of course, the most exciting bit of this project is, and the implication is whether deleterious mutation are actually stepping stones towards phenotypic novelties. And without these stepping stones, these deleterious um, um, intermediate stages, adaptation would be to novel conditions or to new phenotypes would actually be much slower. So it gets back to a very, very interesting uh, debate between uh, Ronald Fisher and Sewer Wright, which goes back in the 1920s. Wright, uh, Fisher argued that uh, adaptation is mass selection, high population size needed, and it's basically the accumulation uh, of um, beneficial mutations uh, one by one, and deleterious mutations are either too rare or insignificant. Wright, on the other hand, argued that the combination of the two forces are needed to generate, uh, to get to new adaptive peaks. So as you can see, it all gets back to the same old questions uh, with the, probably with the novel perspective and with the chance to investigate these processes in the laboratory and with new genomic data. So with that, I would like to thank to uh, my collaborators, uh, Balash Pop and uh, Peter Horvat, uh, who actually uh, did most of the work on this project. And uh, I would like to thank you guys for your attention. I'm ready to take the questions. Okay. Good. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Very, thank, thank you very much. I am, so we have a um, we have a number of questions here on the question and answer tag. And um, so Delphine, yeah, Sikar, if you want to start, please, I, so, you can, uh, so you can speak now, you can talk. Yep. Yeah, great. Yep. Hi. Shall uh, I, sorry for a sec before we start. Shall I uh, share the screen? Probably yes, right? Because... Um, uh, this is it's okay. Ones. I think it depends on the question. So let's go to... Um, yeah, I, I, well, actually I have two questions. First, thank you very much. It was very clear and nice talk. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I had two questions. The first one is, um, does compensatory evolution depend on uh, historical contingency? So do you see any pattern depending on the strain or origin? whether it's from the same clade or whether it's from the same ecological niches? That's a very interesting question. We, we have not investigated this because as you know, we started with one strain yeah. of, uh, of yeast and used the corresponding knockout library. Now that would be really exciting to invest. In. As a matter of fact, there are multiple knockout libraries for related yeast strains. So we could actually run an evolution experiment starting with different, um, with the same knockout, but with different genetic background, right? Yeah, and because the idea was whether... maybe you know, the history of the deleterious mutation will, will play a, a major role. Uh, and so that's, that could be one way to check for that, right? Yeah. That's very interesting. One thing I know uh, from previous studies, when they compared the knockout libraries from different yeast strains, although they are 99% identical in terms of the, um, the, the genomic sequence, so they're very highly close related, uh, the mutations, the, the knockout of the same knockout, sometimes essential in one genetic background and non-essential in the other. So what it actually shows that uh, loss of function mutations can have very different effect depending on the genetic background, even in close related species. Yeah. I hope I could, that's more yeah, or less yeah, that's, to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> and so my, my second question, if I can, is- sure. So you, you have evolved several times the same mutant, right? Or yes. I'm not sure I, I get that. And if you did, uh, do you find some uh, par parallelism? Yeah. Or compensatory mutation, maybe? Yeah, we do, yep. Yeah. So we had four parallel evolved lines per knockout. Same knockouts, but basically they diverge from each other as a result of laboratory evolution. And when we sequence them, we see some overlap. Uh, uh, in the set of genes, but generally it's different genes 
within the same functional class or within the same protein complex. So it suggests that the mutational target for compensator evolution is large. There could be many different ways of achieving it. And this is why it is so fast. It's just 400 generation and they can that recover fitness. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Link. Um, so, um, Arturo Jale, do you have a question also there? So, please. Uh, yes, first, thank you for, for the great talk. So, my question is related to the, the question of Delphin regarding the repeatability. And I was wondering among the four uh, repeated uh, parallel lineage that were uh, initiated uh, with the same K knockout gene, mm. were the regular, regulatory changes induced by compensatory mutation uh, repeatable between them? Because you mentioned you had uh, uh, transcriptomic uh, data. Well, uh, the honest answer is that I uh, do not know precisely the answer. And okay. uh, the reason being is that the transcriptomic studies uh, focused one strain per knockout. So this one, we, okay. so just that, but that's something we should do in the future. That would be important. I completely agree with you. It was basically the shortage of funding and to- opt Yes, in. yes, of course. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Thanks. Then we have a question also in, the, in this direction by Jessica Consuegra. Jessica, I think you, you should be able to speak now. Okay. Hi, did you, did you listen to me? All right. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so first of all, thanks a lot for the, for the presentation. Very nice. I was wondering about these mutations or the speed this new compensatory mutation should emerge in nature in order to the original mutant don't be counter selected on yeah. the condition this mutation emerged. Yeah, as I said, that uh, I did not get into the details, but I think the, the crucial issue is uh, how, compens how deleterious mutation can reach high frequency in the population. And once they are there at a reasonable frequency, compensatory evolution will readily emerge. I believe, as we see in the, and they can uh, pretty much uh, uh, spread in the population. That's the crucial issue. Is it likely that strongly deleterious loss of function mutations can somehow uh, uh, accumulate in the population or at least reach a reasonable frequency? Now, one thing what, and I'm thinking of is, and this is something, uh, I want to do in the future to test it rigorously is that um, these, these knockouts are not simply deleterious, many of them. As a matter of fact, the knockout provides some fitness advantage in specific environments. So it may be the case if there is an environmental change, these loss of function mutations spread in the population by adaptation because they provide a fitness advantage in one condition. But in a fluctuating environment, there's also a need to minimize the deleterious side effects in the other conditions. So you may not need any genetic drift or small populations or anything to fix or, uh, these, uh, deleterious, or these knockout mutations in the population. And as a matter of fact, we and others measured these uh, knockouts under many different environmental conditions. And there were large number of cases where we could find that such antagonistic pleiotropy, if you like, advantage of the loss of the gene in one condition, but deleterious effect in another environment. Cool, thank you very much. And related with, uh, with that too, what is the role of mutation rates? Do you think it, it will affect this emergence that happened faster or not? Yeah, and I'm pretty sure as with all adaptation, uh, it's very clear that mutator lines can, uh, as in the case of antibiotic resistance, can evolve much faster. Uh, well, well it, all, it will also depend on what really uh, shapes uh, compensatory evolution. Is it depend on the mutation supply or is it about the fixation 
of these genes in the population. It could be a combination of both. But as long as mutation supply is the limiting factor, genomic mutation rate would uh, clearly affect it. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, also in this direction, so Michael Hochberg, I think you, you, you also had a question, so you can... You can... <clears throat> yes, yeah, it's a very nice talk. Uh, my question regards controls, and that is if you were to play out mutants of different fitnesses, so not only your compensatory mutants, but ones with nearly neutral fitness effects, what kinds of morphological changes would you see? And if you were to cross this between the compensatory effect and ordinary adaptive effects in new environments, what would you see? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the first issue, whether what we see would Am I interpreting it right? Whether we would consider slightly deleterious mutations, right? That would have much smaller effect or not necessarily loss of function mutations, right? That's right. Whether we would see the same pattern. Right, so the question is, is whether mor morphology is reserved to these compensatory mutations. Um, uh, Compared to loss of fun, compared to deleterious mutations, or yes, or, or slightly, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, all I can say is that we did compare, as I said in the scenario, whether is the compensate. Sorry, the morphological changes are the result of uh, the knockout per se, or and it's uh, or is it because of the compensatory mutations, and basically. So far, what we see, and I cannot give you an exact figure right now, but it's roughly 50-50% of the cases. So we see evidence for both scenarios. When it comes to slightly deleterious mutations, we have not tested it, but it's actually very simple to do that. And this would be a very nice follow-up studies. There are other ways of generating deleterious mutations in the laboratory and accumulate, one can accumulate them under very low population sizes. And uh, people have done it. It's a mutation, mutation accumulation experiments. I'm, not, I'm sure you're familiar with them. And basically they, they accumulate hundreds of mutations in some time and, and there were no selection pressures. So they are either deleterious or new, slightly deleterious mutations or neutral. And I think no one has actually checked whether as a result of these uh, slightly deleterious mutation accumulation, what would be the effect on cellular morphology? That would be very interesting to see. Right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Then we have one question by Guillaume Cambray. Guillaume, if you're, you want to, uh, to speak aloud. No, it's not there anymore. Then we have um, the, the no, Tomale Norman. I think, I think he's there. He just needs to activate his microphone. Yeah, actually, I, I think I did. Okay. 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 my mic. Hi. Nice Hello. talk. Thanks. So I was wondering about whether you could say something about how many of these compensatory mutations would have to do with functional novelty versus the wiring of the, of the expression network. Hello? Yeah, I'm, I'm just yeah. one, I, I'm thinking what to respond. Yeah. Do we believe, uh, yeah, it's, do we believe that these are two uh, mutually excluding scenarios? In my eyes, what I would believe is that what actually happening is it's partly rewiring the expression network and as a result, generating morphological changes. Of course, I don't have any hardcore proof of that, but I don't see as alternatives necessarily. So maybe in the one example that you gave, uh, I believe it was the genes may. Okay, yeah. Right. What, what, what was the mutation actually? Oh yeah, it was not, okay, that's, that's a good point. This was actually uh, not, uh, uh, it was clearly not a rewiring of the expression network or it was not changing the expression of the gene. It was really a structural mutation in SWE1. Right, cool. So, yeah, that, but in general, I think you raise a very important point. Um, 
Is it likely that in strains that show high reorganization or rewiring of the transcription network, is it, are these the strains that should show more morphological novelties? I don't know. That would be something that would be exciting to, uh, to work out. Yep, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thank you. Then, so, uh, so then, uh, Thomas, Thomas Norman, so you had also uh, some some questions on this regard. Yeah. Uh, hi. Hello there. So, um, I was wondering um, because you got this result that you got fifty percent, roughly fifty fifty percent um, morphological effects for deleterious mutation and compensatory mutations, mm -hmm. and perhaps. One interpretation might be that simply um, all those morphological changes are just pleiotropic effect of kind of any mutation, and uh, that's explaining why you don't find any specific effect for these compensatory mutations. Uh, so perhaps there is nothing really special about them. Uh, uh, just so morphological change here seems just to be a random pleiotropic effect of any kind of mutation, don't mm -hmm. what you think? Mm -hmm. Well, what, I, I'm wondering whether this is indeed the case. Uh, uh, what we did see is that uh, we had these control lines, you know, no, no uh, knockouts, but we run parallel evolution with them. And in these lines, even though they accumulated mutations, uh, they show no, no changes in, uh, in morphology. That, now, it's not to say, I cannot say that, it, it, you, of course you can say, and I think you were, would be right, it may be that they accumulated fewer mutations, right? And this is the case. It's not about the quality of the mutations or the type of mutations per se. Now, I think you raise a point and I think it should be taken seriously. So what if I just uh, had a different, so I just adapt these to new environments and then see if they evolve new morphotypes? I think they would. Yeah, I think the key think question so. is whether you got phenotypic, uh, several peaks uh, in terms of phenotypic space or, or not, yeah. which is not yeah. totally clear. Yeah. I agree. I think I, well, the, the reason I find probably our work was interesting is because you fix the environment, no environmental changes, and, um, and basically just as a result of the combination of the two process, you see major changes in the morphology. And if you do the same experiments with the Y type, they also accumulate mutation, but they don't show uh, um, major changes in the morphology or any of these phenotypic traits. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Then, then we have a, so Yanis Michalakis, you had two questions also to, to pose, so, so you, can, you can talk now if you want. Yeah, well, I think the, the first one is, has already been addressed in part by Je the question by Jessica and the, in part by um, the answer that was given to Tomas's question. So I'll just uh, pass to the second one, um, which is um, um, whether you see any evidence in your results uh, for um, ridges, uh, 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 fitness ridges linking uh, uh, genotypes that would be spaced uh, far apart uh, mm -hmm. in the fitness landscape. That is my question explicit enough or do you want yeah. me to, yeah? Well, that's a very interesting question. What we should demonstrate, please tell me if I interpret it uh, wrongly. It would be these bridges would facilitate evolution of new morphotypes that could not otherwise evolve. <laughs> right? That would be awesome. I don't know how to how to demonstrate it. it. Let's say we just 
use hundreds of environments and adaptation to new conditions and refine morphotypes, which would never evolve otherwise. You need these deleterious mutations to find these uh, new morphotypes. Uh, well, but the, the, the idea of the ridge is precisely that uh, uh, single mutations that take you, so you have, you have the, the genotype that sits on the yeah. say standard peak and in order to get on the, so there is another genotype that sits on another peak, but if you cross them immediately, well, you cannot go directly from one to the other. So you need a sort of intermediate path. And the idea of the ridge is that individual mutations that will take you from one to the other are not going to be, are going to be only slightly deleterious, perhaps even not deleterious at all. So I, th I thought that in the, yeah. in the data you showed, uh, well, in one of the figures that you showed, I think in the first part, you had some indication of this in that uh, if I saw this correctly, um, there, there were some of the um, compensatory mutations were not deleterious in the ancestral context. So many of them were, but uh, yeah, the last one I think is not, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So perhaps that's an indication of something like this. I know if you, my, so my question would, would then be, whether you looked at this in a more systematic way um, to see whether this is an indication of that. Mm -hmm. No, not actually, I must admit. One, one thing which um, I, I actually try to emphasize uh, is that, of course, it's not a thorough study again. So it's not like we studied this systematically, but this, um, yeah, basically this figure, so basically the compensatory mutation in the wild type background do not generate the novel phenotype. The deleterious mutation doesn't generate the novel phenotype. You need the combination of the two mutations to find enhanced invasiveness. Okay, so it suggests, of course, it's not like uh, we generated hundreds of mutation and see whether there are other ways in the adaptive landscape whereby invasive phenotype can be reached. So it's not a four study. It's, it's basically just as example on a very limited scale. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I think I would have a question regarding, it goes along the line of the, the question by Guillaume Cambré. And it has to do with the, with this rewiring of, um, of the transcriptome and then, uh, then eventually the proteome also and, the, and, uh, and all the, so the, the, in, the, in the interaction, the protein-protein interactions and the gene interactions, my question is how heritable are these changes, these adap uh, um, uh, adaptive changes in, in gene regulation? How heritable are they? And uh, how is it in terms of plasticity of the wild type related to the plasticity, phenotypic plasticity of the evolved mutants. So the evolved mutants with the, which change that there's a shift in phenotype. And then, so is, is the, 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 uh, the adaptive plasticity also affected by the, this rewiring of gene expression? If there is, so assuming that there, is, there are no mutations in terms of, of, of genes that are um, knocked down or depleted or ablated, but simply in terms of, of regulation. So these things, so how, how are it, heritable are these changes? And then second, how they, they interact with um, phenotypic plasticity. Mm -hmm. Okay, again, uh, so these are brilliant questions because uh, I always start that I don't know. <laughs> so that's again the case <laughs> that I, uh, I really don't know, but I have an idea how to investigate. Uh, so we have not measured phenotypic plasticity. And of course you can measure it at different levels on a single cell level, but we actually have, a, have data to measure phenotypic plasticity at the morphological level. Because uh, what, and we have the data already because whenever I say that there's a change in morphological character, all I say is that we, we measured hundreds of cells of the same sample and then we give you an average or whatever, uh, or the median. 
But as a matter of fact, there's also deviation from one cell to the other. And there are, of course, protocols, established protocols to measure phenotypic plasticity at the morphological level. So it would be a really exciting thing to do is to uh, get an index or an estimate on morphological plasticity of the evolved lines, the knockouts, the wild type, and see how it cha has changed. And of course, it would be a big bonus if you could uh, do it for transcriptomic as well. Have I answered it or? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 it is, it, it, it is an answer. How about heritability uh, when it comes to rewiring of transcription and transcriptome or proteome? Well. <laughs> 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 yep. Okay. I need some time to answer <laughs> this later one, I, I believe. <laughs> okay, good. Well. I then, then thank you, thank you very much. We have consumed also one one hour one hour of the, of, of time with all with a very nice uh, timing for question. Uh, so I thank you, Tavaval, for this uh, for 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 this presentation. Thank you very much for your for your time and for being available for um, to us. And then I invite you to the to, to all of you to join us for our next uh, seminar on Friday with the presentation by Alexis Adi on the phenotypic evolution of uh, of uh, the teeth uh, teeth in bats and then with this i want to so i thank you one, once again Chava, for your time thank you for for being here and then looking forward to some to share some science with you next friday thank you for the and, yeah thanks uh, a lot for the invitation and the kind well and and, and uh, for the uh, very good questions and there's a lot a uh, uh, lot for thought food for thoughts for the weekend and <laughs> for the year, actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Take care, guys. Okay. Thank you very much. One important point is that the seminar next week is at 4 p.m. because the guest is from the U.S. Thank you. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.